Welcome to the Cleansing Word Podcast with Pastor John of Calvary Chapel, Lake Villa. Join us as we go through the Bible as we encourage your walk with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about Calvary Chapel, Lake Villa, visit us at cclv.org. And please share and subscribe to this podcast. Now let's hear a message from God's Word. I watched a little video clip of Amir Sarfati today um, and saying that it looked like the war, and I haven't, that was early this morning, which meant 13 hours ahead of us, that it was sometime in the evening last night that he gave a little update and said it looks like they're about ready to go into war against Hezbollah in the north, and uh, Israel had struck a couple of warehouses deep, I believe in Lebanon or Syria, I can't remember which one, but they were housing thousands of drones, and so Israel got rid of the drones. And uh, yesterday, uh, Hezbollah fired about 100 rockets immediately into the north, and uh, he said they were testing all the sirens like this the missile sirens and he was said they were just going through stages like from one station to the next in the north preparing the people that war is coming so we know that they're in war in the south and it looks like war may be coming in the north as well so again pray for israel and the peace of israel so we're going to look at joshua 22 and 23 tonight and It's kind of, we do know from Joshua chapter 24 that Joshua was 110 years old when he dies. And so we know his age when he dies. We are never given his age when he took over the role of leading Israel after Moses passed on. We assume that he and Caleb were probably around the same age. At one point, Caleb tells us, and they've been in the land for a little bit, and he would say, I am 85 years old, and I'm as strong today as I was, you know, back when I was 40 years old. So give me my possession. Give me my land. And so if they were about the same age, uh, if Joshua was around 80 when he began the conquest of the promised land, we can get at least somewhere between 25 to 30 to 35 years. If he was 80, it had been 30 years um, of the conquest of the land. So uh, quite a bit had passed. I mean, that's 30 years, half, a little more than half my lifetime now, but kind of half my lifetime. And I can tell you a bit has happened in my life in the last 30 years. I was not pastoring this church 30 years ago, but... I, in fact, I wasn't even attending. Is that right? No, we were here, were we? 94. Started attending in 94, but we were still living in California. So, yeah, a lot has happened. Um, So a lot has happened for Israel as well. They have divided up the land, and now in chapter 22, the eastern tribes are going home, and the eastern tribes being the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and a half-tribe of Manasseh. They requested their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan River in the lands that were conquered by the two great kings, Og and 
Um, I can't think of the other king's name, but we'll probably read it because they keep repeating it. Um, anyways, we're going to read about them going home, but an incident that took place as they make their way home. So Joshua 22, verse 5, a key verse. Joshua said, that's not in scripture. I threw that one in. <laughs> But take careful heed to do the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And for me, that's a key verse in this chapter because Jesus would use those very same words when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? So we begin chapter 22, looking at verses 1 through 9. And then Joshua called the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brethren these many days up to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren that he promised them. Now therefore return and go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But take careful heed to do the commandments and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to hold fast to him, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now the half-tribe of Manasseh, Moses, had given a possession in Bashan, but to the other half, of it, Joshua gave possession among the brethren on this side of the Jordan westward. And indeed, when Joshua sent them away to their tents, he blessed them and spoke to them, saying, Return with much riches to your tents, with your very much livestock, with silver, with gold, with bronze, with iron, with very much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brethren. So the children of Israel the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh returned and departed from the children of Israel at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the country of Gilead and to the land of their possession, which they have obtained according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So I'm not saying that this event took place 30 years later, but there was a process where... Um, the children of Israel, the nine and a half tribes, had occupied the promised land on the west side of the Jordan River. The land had been allotted to them, as we have studied in the passage, beginning in verse, uh, chapter 14 through 19, the, the dividing up of the land. They still had to go and conquer, so there's still war to take place. There are still battles to be Raged. We'll read about those battles, uh, especially when we get to the book of Judges uh, next month after our Easter celebration. But they were commanded to go. Go with the livestock, the silver, the gold, the bronze, the iron, the clothing that they had acquired. But go with the commandment of Moses, the law of Moses, that they should... Obey, to love the Lord God with all their heart, with all their soul, to heed those things which were spoken to them. And so Joshua commended them. You not only obeyed the word that you gave to Moses, but you obeyed me as well. Now go with my blessings. Now Jesus used these similar words. I mean, they're found several times in Scripture, to love the Lord your God. We find it in... Leviticus 19, there's a, a verse there that speaks about loving your neighbor as yourself. We find that here, Jesus quotes that portion of Leviticus 19, 
in Matthew 22, 37 and 40, but he also begins with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So they went their way. In verses 10 through 20, a bit of reading tonight. And when it came to the region of the Jordan, which is the land of Canaan, and the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great, impressive altar. Now the children of Israel heard someone say, Behold, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the children of Israel's side. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered at Shiloh. Now, if you recall, this is where they had set up the tabernacle. So they came to the house of the Lord to inquire of the Lord what they might do. So they gathered together, verse 12, at Shiloh to go to war against them. That's what was on their ha heart. But wisely... Verse 13, the children of Israel sent Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priests and the children of Reuben to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh to the land of Gilead. And with him, 10 rulers, one ruler each from the chief house of every tribe of Israel. And each one was the head of the house of his father among the divisions of Israel. And they came to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the children of the half-tribe Manasseh, I threw an extra children in there, to the land of Gideon, Gilead, sorry, they spoke to them saying, thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, what treachery is this that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord that you have built for yourself an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord? Is the iniquity of Peor not enough for us, from which we are not cleansed till this day. That's an interesting phrase. From which we are not cleansed till this day. There were repercussions, even though God judged and 24,000 Israelis died, Israel is saying, we're still dealing with this. Verse 18, but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord. It shall be if you rebel today against the Lord that tomorrow he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. Nevertheless, if the land of your possession is unclean, then cross over to the land of the possession of the Lord where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take possession among us. But do not rebel against the Lord nor rebel against us by building yourself an altar besides the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on the congregation of Israel, and that man did not perish alone in his iniquity? So they gathered together. They heard about this great, impressive altar, and they gathered together together first at the tabernacle, but the purpose was to gather for war. Now they were wise. They sent counsel first. They inquired, hey guys, what's going on? They sent the high priest's son, Phineas, to go and to check this out. They sent rulers from each of the 10 tribes of those of the Western tribes. And we say Eastern tribes, Western tribes. It all has to do with the Jordan River. If they lived on the east side of the Jordan, they were an eastern tribe. If they lived on the west side of the Jordan, which is the majority of Israel today, they were of the western tribes. So ten and nine and a half tribes on the west, two and a half tribes to the east. And they sent men to inquire and to investigate. The delegation reminded the eastern tribes of two past incidents where people had rebelled against Yahweh. I found it interesting. I've been going through this. In fact, I had chapter 22 
ready last week. And I went over it again and a couple of times just reading through my notes and maybe tweaking a few things. But as I'm reading to you, I found it interesting that when they spoke about Peor, and that's the sin of Balaam, when Balak hired Balaam, his desire was for Balaam to curse Israel. Of course, God would not allow Balaam to curse Israel, and he blessed them four times. But still, he taught Balak how he could get God to come against Israel by teaching their people how to sin. And so they sent the girls in, they tempted the boys, there was fornication, adulterous relationships going on. Some kind of plague went through the camp. 24,000 died. Phineas was the one who put an end to the plague by the boldness of one Israeli man and a Midianite woman who walked right in front of Moses and Aaron and right into their tent. And they were, I mean, Scripture tells us Phineas went in there with a spear and thrust them to, through um, which meant they were having sexual relations. He killed two birds with one stone, we might say, one spear. And that ended the plague. But here, they said that we are still dealing with this. Although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord, they're still dealing with it to this day, verse 16 to this day. So they warned them, and yet they gave the second example. And I find it interesting that, uh, well, Psalm 106, some of the Psalms speak about these as well. And so it's a warning that wasn't just for their generation, but a warning that was for future generations as well, because they appear in the Psalms. Psalm 106, 28, they enjoined themselves also to Baal of Peor, and they ate sacrifices made to the dead. So not just sexual immorality, but worshiping other gods and sacrificing to the dead. And then they reminded them of the sin of Achan. This is those, you know, the first incident was under Moses' rule, but the second incident was under Joshua's rule at that time when they were going to take the city of Ai and initially when they came into the promised land they took the city of Jericho God said you don't take any booty from this place it belongs to me so you burn it all get rid of it all the um, wares and stuff that they did take was given to the temple of God God said it belongs to me but Achan took some items there, some gold, some silver, a Babylonian garment. He hid them in the tents, and they went to the city of Ai, which was a small city, but the, and they say small city, there was like 12,000 soldiers there, but uh, anyways, they were a small city, and this was the confidence of Israel. When Ai came out to battle, and we get a number at one point of 12,000, Israel initially went into battle against them with only 3,000. So they had confidence, and yet they were routed in battle. And because of the sin of Achan, ultimately it cost Achan his own life, all of his family, and 36 other men's lives. In fact, 1 Chronicles 2, 7, they call him a car there, the son of Carmi, was a car or Achan as we know it, but they gave him this nickname in First Corinthians, First Chronicles two seven, the troubler of Israel. He was the troubler of Israel, who transgressed against the accursed things. So they offered. If you feel like the land that you are going home to occupy is unclean, then come and live with us. We'll make room for you. Come to the western side, but do not rebel against the Lord. Sometimes it's good. I think they did. I mean, they gathered for war. What? What's going on here? They gathered for war, and yet they sent a delegation. Proverbs 15, 
1 and 2 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pour forth foolishness. So soft answer turns away wrath, and the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. And we see that happening, I believe, in this chapter. They're just trying to understand, what are you guys doing? And it was just a misunderstanding. Have you ever got upset, actually exchanged words over a total misunderstanding? Has that ever happened to you guys? It's happened to me. <laughs> and wise, soft answers. Uh, sometimes we should calm down. There's a couple of times since I've been your pastor that we were doing projects with uh, larger in the community. And uh, I think both times it had to do with the bunk bed project that we were doing through love in the name of Christ with the other churches in this area, Sharefest, and uh, just managing, building 25 bunk beds, getting them distributed and stuff. And there were a couple of times where John the foreman uh, began to rear the ugly side. <laughs> I was a good foreman, don't take, take me wrong, but I dealt with things on the job if I had to. And uh, never using a cursed word, but sometimes using strong words. And, you know, I, I, I just remember those days when, when it happens. It's like, oh, yeah, I used to be like that a lot. I'm glad I'm not like that anymore. Soft answers. So the misunderstanding is explained, verses 21 through 34. The children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, answered and said to the heads of the division of Israel, the Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods. He knows, and let Israel itself know, if it is in rebellion or if in treachery against the Lord, do not save us this day. If we have built ourselves an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer on it burnt offerings or grain offerings, or if to offer peace offerings on it, let the Lord himself require an account. But in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason saying, in time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants saying, what have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a border between you and us. You, children of Reuben, children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants would make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare and build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generations after us, that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. So basically, they were saying there that when we show up, wherever the tabernacle is at, right now it's at Shiloh, but it would relocate. Eventually, it would be a temple in Jerusalem. But when we show up, we don't want the nine and a half tribes in the future saying, you have no part with us here. So it was to be a witness between you and us. In verse 29, far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to build an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, for sacrifices, besides the altar of the Lord our God, which is before his tabernacle. Now when Phinehas, the priests, and the rulers of the congregation, the heads of the divisions of Israel, who were with him, heard the words of the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh spoke. It pleased them. And then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh, 
This day we perceive that the Lord is among us because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have delivered the children of Israel out of the hand of the Lord. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, the rulers, returned to, or from the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, from the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the children of Israel, and brought back word to them. So the thing pleased the children of Israel, and the children of Israel blessed God. They spoke no more of going against them in battle to destroy the land where the children of Israel and Gad dwelt. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar witness, for it was a witness between us that the Lord is God. So the two and a half tribes never intended for the altar to be used, but it was a memorial to stand between all the tribes, that it would be a witness between them from the eastern tribes and the western tribes that they were actually one nation under God. Can we say that? One nation under God. That future generations, I was, as I was reading that, I was thinking that as warriors, there's something about when you go to battle. I, I'm not a warrior, so I wouldn't know this in that sense. But when you go to battle with others, it kind of knits you together. I don't think this generation could have forgotten. No doubt there were times when one from the tribe of Gad saved someone from the tribe of Dan or vice versa. They had been in war together. They had scars. Third generation perhaps would never forget. But what about the next generation or the generation after that? What are we saying in our own nation today? How about our churches? Though we may be part of the church who stands strong in the Lord and will never forget the things that God has done for us, what's the witness standing between us and future generations? How will they be convinced of the truth of the gospel to know Jesus as their Savior? And so they set up this memorial that future generations would not say in time to come, you have no part in the Lord, basically, they built an altar to ensure that their children after them would always be welcomed to come and worship the Lord at the true altar that stood before the tabernacle of God. Deuteronomy 12, 13 and 14 says, Take heed to yourselves that you do not offer burnt offerings in any place that you see, but in the place which the Lord chooses, in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. So as we close out this chapter, there's three things that I noticed. I've noticed a couple of more th since I've been reading it to you. I love the Word of God for that very purpose. I mean, I've, as I said, I was prepared last week to teach this chapter and uh, didn't get to it. Prepared... Again, took the notes, even shrunk it. You know, I, I said my iPad had 41 pages originally. And I thought, can't do 41 pages. I've been doing this for a while. I know how many pages are good for both of us. And usually 19 to 22 is like perfect. 19 is on the short side. I'm never short. 22 can get on the long side. I'm often long. 41, I don't know where we would be. But three things I noticed earlier today. First, there is such division within the church today that at times it does not seem that we are worshiping the same Jesus. Nevertheless, we do have some reminders in our faith. And these reminders can be faith in Christ, in Christ alone. Baptism communion, and the Bible itself. If churches are able to agree upon these basic things, these stand as witnesses between us that though we may do things a little differently from one another, our main goal should be our devotion to the Lord and our worship of Jesus Christ. Joshua twenty-two thirty-four, For it is a witness between us 
that the Lord is God. And so I know there are some churches out there, there are some pastors out there that I have, for some, maybe no agreement whatsoever. They're just so far at one end of the extreme, and they may view me far at the other end of the extreme, that we will have not any agreement. But there are a number of churches that may do things a lot differently than us. And yet we have agreement on the fundamentals, the foundation of our faith. Some of these being faith in Christ alone, baptism, communion, the Bible. And those things, we can stand. Their missionary over in Ukraine was... For two years, because of the war, he's a musician, and uh, he's part of the Calvary Chapel movement. And as soon as the Iron Curtain fell, his dad left his church in Indiana, turned it over to the assistant pastor, and went to Ukraine with his family. And so John, his dad, passed away. John and his brother George, and I know they had more siblings in this, but they, they were raised in Ukraine. And uh, the last two Christmases, because of the war that's going on between Ukraine and Russia, John has been given some great opportunity. He has traveled with the Ukrainian orchestra and his worship team. I mean, John's an excellent musician. And uh, this last year, Catholic Radio there in Ukraine said, would you mind, initially it was like, would you mind playing some music for us, live music around Christmas, and we'll give you a time slot? And it's like, sure, I can do that. And then ultimately they said, could you handle like four hours and teach a message too? This is Catholic Radio. And he was just like, sure, but I don't know what I'm going to say. And so one of the professors at Western Seminary said, why don't you speak about the things that we agree upon? And it's Christmas. And there's a lot that we agree upon with the Catholic Church about Christmas and the birth of Christ. And I don't know what John ended up doing, but that sounded like wisdom. There are things that we agree upon. So why not speak on those things? Save the battles for other, other days or maybe in a different audience. But uh, nonetheless, three things that I noticed. The first, there is division in the church today, so much so that it doesn't seem like we worship the same Jesus. But if we can find common ground, we should take advantage of that. Second, the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half-tribe Manasseh, they eventually had drifted away from the Lord. And many believe this happened because they took their possession on the eastern side of the Jordan River. They were close, but they weren't in the promised land proper. And sometimes when we put distance between us and the Lord, it's an easy way to begin to drift away from the Lord. Hebrews 2.1 says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. I, it's easy. I mean, I might hear from a couple of people if I stop coming to church, I hope. It's John, what's going on? I hope you'd get on your pastor if he quit coming. <laughs> it's just like, ah, I gave it up. But... It doesn't take much, and we've seen it. We've witnessed it. I've been, I grew up in a church. My dad got saved when I was two months old, and that was at a church meeting. And so I can say I've been in church my whole life, and I've witnessed many people drift away. And sometimes it's just by putting distance, and before you know it, they're all together gone. The third thing, it's important for all Israel to have 
I think this monument was important to them to remind the future generations that though a river divided them, they were actually a united people, one nation under God. Proverbs twenty two twenty eight. This has been speaking to me more and more because we see it happening in our country today. Do not remove the ancient landmarks that which your fathers have set up. And it's dangerous for a nation to forget where they came from or willfully forget these things. Some just don't know because they've never been taught. But others are willfully forgetting. They're stripping away the monuments, the statues, um, scripture that's maybe in public places. They strip away things little by little until the whole nation goes astray. Sometimes they forget because they neglect to rehearse the history of our nation or they're no, no longer taught history. Second, they willfully forget because they remove the ancient landmarks. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you shall find rest for your souls. And they said, we will not walk in it. Now, this is in rebellion, of course, against God. So we don't like the end of that verse. We will not walk in it. We like the beginning of the verse where God said, asked for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. It's there in the old paths that we find rest for our souls. So the key is staying near. Hebrews 10, let us draw near with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Staying near, ask for the old past. We might do things somewhat differently. I mean, I was in the mid 80s when worship music just started becoming a popular thing in churches. I mean, it had been around. It just takes a while for some folks to get around. Uh, Calvary Chapel started using guitars in worship in the 60s and 70s. But it wasn't until the mid-80s, where church where Lily and I were attending, that they thought, you know what? We would like to introduce guitar and bass. And ultimately, we had... Guitar, bass, lead guitar, drums, saxophone player, uh, piano player. That was a given. Um, but it began on Sunday nights with the pianist, my friend John Marcourt is on guitar, and me on the bass. And that was the introduction in that church. Let's go in slow, and let's begin to introduce this. So we may do things differently but we, the foundation should still be the same. We don't want to change the foundation. We want to build upon it, but not change it. Chapter 23, he encourages the next generation. In a key verse, verse 6, Therefore be courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. That's not the whole verse, but that's an important portion of that verse in Joshua 23, in verse 6, a key verse for me in this chapter. 1 through 3 begins reminding them that Yahweh has fought for you. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel. So here we have a long time after the Lord. I had said initially that we're not quite sure how old Joshua was when he began the campaigns, when they entered in to the promised land proper and took Jericho, maybe around 80 years old. We can assume he might have been around the age of Caleb. We do know that he dies when he's 110. So if he is around the age of Caleb, maybe 25, 30 years. Here they said a long time had passed. So the incident, and what I want us to understand is the children of Reuben, and Gad and Manasseh didn't have to stay and help conquer the land for 30 years. That was wrapped up maybe around seven and a half years. They were gone, you know, between seven and 10 years, maybe a decade.
but they weren't gone forever from their families. Now we begin. A long time had passed after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old and well advanced in age. And Joshua called for all the uh, Joshua called for all Israel, for their elders, for their heads, for their judges, for their officers, and said to them, I am old, advanced in age. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who fought for you. So several years have passed since Israel had crossed over into the promised land. And they have occupied the land. They have had rest from their enemies. There are still enemies round about, but for the most part, they control the region, though there will be battles. And we'll read about those battles when we get to the book of Judges. This was the land that Yahweh had promised to give to Abraham and his descendants, a covenant that Yahweh directly passed on from Abraham's son Isaac to his grandson Jacob. And that covenant, I'm going to read a little bit further than um, what is written in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3 is the main covenant, the initial uh, covenant that God made with Abraham. But we'll look at a few more verses as well. But verses 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord God said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed is a messianic phrase of this blessing. How could all the families of the earth be blessed in Abraham? Well, through the coming of Jesus Christ. But in verse 5, he goes on, So they came from, to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the Terebith tree of Moray, and the Canaanites were then in the land. And the Lord, verse 7, appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So with Israel's initial conquest, the land divided into its tribal territories, having rest for several years, and Joshua admittedly saying, you know what? I am old. Well advanced in age. Well, Sonny, get over here. I don't know what he sounded like. He reminded Israel's leaders of what they had witnessed with their own eyes. I think that's so important sometimes. That we remember the things that the Lord has done for us, the things that we have witnessed with our own eyes, that we can pass them on to future generations. But specifically here, how the Lord their God had fought for them. There is always this danger of forgetting those things which the Lord does for us. And it was true for Israel, and it's true for us to this day. For Israel, many of these things, Joshua said, you witness them with your own eyes. Your eyes have seen them. Moses, when he did a similar thing in Deuteronomy chapter 4, he encouraged his generation and this same generation, but they were much younger then, before they even entered into the promised land. Now, at least 25, 30 years has passed. But he had said to them, remember that day at Horeb, the great mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain, where Yahweh spoke to you with his own voice. You heard it with your own ears. So for Moses, it was reminding this generation of what they had seen at Horeb, the mountain of the Lord. For Joshua, perhaps the greatest evidence of Yahweh fighting for them was the day that the sun stood still, still for almost 24 hours. Now, even if you weren't part of that battle, it didn't matter where you were at. You knew there was something different about that day. 
It's like, wait a minute. It's 8 o'clock and it's still light out? Or it's 10 o'clock and it's still daylight? What's going on? Joshua 10, 13, the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. <laughs> when I was much younger in church, my dad pastoring, so I was a boy, a teenager. He used to have this newspaper article. I may have it in my dad's desk because um, I have his desk and I have a lot of that stuff, but I don't know if I've seen this article for a long time that said that... Uh, through computers, they had figured out that the earth had stopped for a full day throughout history and connected them to two things in the Bible. This one of Joshua um, having the sun to stand still, asking God to have the sun stand still. And then um, Ahaz and the Lord saying, what shall be a sign? And the hour hand of the clock moved backwards. And so through computer and out, I don't know. My dad used to have a news. It was in the newspaper. It had to be true. <laughs> it's on the Internet. It's got to be true. I don't know, but it's in the Word of God, and I'll stand by the Word of God on this. But in their memory, they had seen it with their own eyes. There were other things, too. They talked about God sending hornets before them, that hail would come down with mingled with fire. They saw the walls of Jericho fall down. They had seen many things with their own eyes, but they were not to forget these things that their eyes had seen. They were to teach them to their children. Deuteronomy 4, 9 says, Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. So it begins right there. We keep ourselves in the ways of the Lord, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. It may it be that we would not forget the things of Christ that we have witnessed, that we have experienced, share those things with our children, our grandchildren, and I can add great-grandchild now. So I'll keep bragging on that. <laughs> Verses 4 and 5, See, I have divided to you by lot these nations that remain. So this is Joshua speaking. I've divided the land by lot to be an inheritance for your tribes from the Jordan with all the nations that I've cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you. So Joshua is saying, this is what has happened under my administration uh, we have divided the land. We have driven out these nations. But verse 5, here's what the Lord is go going to continue to do. I'm old. I'm well advanced in years. I don't have many days left. But verse 5, and the Lord your God will expel them from before you and drive them out, out of your sight. So you shall possess their land as the Lord God promised you. So having kept up what he had been commissioned to do, to occupy the land, divide the land between the tribes. Joshua encouraged Israel that God would continue to fight for him. You've seen it with your own eyes that God has fought for you, but he's going to continue to fight for you. Philippians 1.6, a great verse for us to know, being confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And I don't doubt that. There's so much that the Lord has already done in my life, but I'm not thinking that I have arrived. I'm looking forward to the completion of the work in the day of Christ when I see him face to face. So at times, God might leave us amid our enemies. And God did it for a reason here. Exodus 23, 30 reminded them, little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased that you might inherit the land. God had explained, I'm not going to drive them out all at once. If I do so, you're not enough people to occupy the land that you're going into. And so they're going to help keep things tended. Keep working on the homes, keep working on the fields, keep the wild beasts from coming in. But little by little, 
I will drive them out from before you. There's a missionary named Don Richardson. He had made this statement, faith that isn't tested is not true. And Joshua challenges the people to remain faithful to the Lord, but in doing so, they would find that God would remain faithful to them, helping them to take complete possession of the promised land. But sadly, this would not take place until the time of King David. There would be a number of years, hundreds of years of battles before them. But faith that is not tested is not true. And I think at times God leaves us in situations to test our faith. I kind of view it sometimes that God wants to build in us spiritual muscle and strength that we wouldn't simply have if we hadn't been tested in that way. I can still remember my first day as a laborer for brick masons. And uh, one of the first things one of the guys did, he was, it was a partnership, so he was one of the bosses. And he came over and he said, Johnny, let me teach you how to shovel mortar. And I thought, I know how to shovel. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, I got pretty good at shoveling mortar. And there are tricks. And uh, there's a point to where I could throw a shovel of mortar up a scaffold or two. Of course, you need somebody up there to catch it. But I could throw it, and they could catch. Or they could throw to me, and I could catch we didn't do that all the time. We had machines. But <laughs> um, I thought, I know how to shovel. And there was so much that I had to learn. And in that first year, I built a lot of muscle. I was 145 pounds. I was lifting Portland bags that weighed 90 pounds. And uh, they were hard to lift at first. But I built muscle because of doing. And I think spiritually we can apply some of the same truths in our own lives that God gives us and puts us in circumstances that causes us to build muscle that we become seasoned warriors as these were in Israel at that time. They were all seasoned warriors. And I think sometimes we might fail our own children, where we might be seasoned in the things of Christ, we don't pass it on in such a way that they become seasoned. And I realize that they need to have their own battles. They need to have those own challenges that raises them up. But we can no doubt help them and teach them. So he says to them, verses 6 through 11, Therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, lest you turn around or turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. And lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them, but you shall hold fast to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. So they've done well up to this day. For it is the Lord, for the Lord has driven out from before you a great and strong nations. But as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he has promised. Therefore, take Careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. So if you love the Lord your God, you will not mess around with other gods, other people who worship different gods, learn about their gods to bow down and worship them. You'll hold fast to the word of the Lord. You'll hold fast to the Lord because you love him. To take careful heed. So these words, to be very courageous in verse 6, it reminded me of what Moses, what Yahweh, what the men of war spoke to Joshua some 30 plus years earlier. 
Moses said to Joshua in Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear or be afraid of them. For the Lord, your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. God, in Joshua 1, 7, said to Joshua, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe and do all that's in the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right hand or to the left. We've seen those words as well in our text here. That you may prosper wherever you go. And then the men of war, this was actually the two and a half tribes, the eastern tribes of Israel, in Joshua 1.18, they said, Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. They said, we're going to obey, and if somebody doesn't, we'll just take care of it. But then they said to Joshua, only be strong and of good courage. So Joshua took the words of encouragement that was given to him by Moses, by Yahweh, by the two and a half tribes of Israel, and now he's encouraging the whole nation. He understood the danger of turning away from the Lord, turning whether to the right hand or to the left would cause Israel to mingle with other nations, unbelieving nations, these nations that God had already judged and was judging. He warns them not to even mention their names, not to swear by them, not to bow down to them, but rather to hold fast to the Lord as they had done to this day. There are many things in this world that we should just not mess with, have no knowledge of, have innocence about it. Sometimes necessity causes us to learn things that maybe we would not want to learn, but, you know, positions that we have as a pastor, I read a lot. There's some things I'd rather not know, but I explore um, the conditions of our world and able to teach properly. Um, I did a radio show recor recording on Freemasonry yesterday that will, I don't know, it'll, in a week or two it'll be broadcast. I think Satan was messing with us because we had bad communication. Um, he was in North Carolina. I was here and uh, it was supposed to be two shows. It ended up being one show, which is fine. Um, but I keep exploring these things about Freemasonry that my dad was very much involved with and I was familiar with as a child growing up. And there are some things my sisters talk to me about it and they just, they hear these things, these shows, this is number seven that I've done. And they're like, I cannot believe that dad was messed up or mixed up in that stuff. I said, yeah, well, he was. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe it either. Dad, what were you thinking? Um, and it might shock us, and you learn things. But sometimes innocence is good. Ephesians 5.11 reminds us to have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We were talking about this the other night. Lily was with... I think Mackenzie, our granddaughter, and maybe Philip was there. I'm not sure. But there was a time when I was youth pastor over in Zion. So this was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I was probably about 28, 29 years old at the time, 30 maybe. Um, but we were doing a youth event, and there was going to be about 100 to 125 kids coming out for this event. And in one of my classes... One of the youth had said at one time, I only watch scary movies because they scare me. And my thought instantly was, oh yeah? What else do you see when you're trying to be scared in these movies? What else are they teaching you? And so I sat down, our kids would go to bed and at night, and back then we'd put the VHS in. I did this on my own, but um, for several weeks I watched all of Halloween I haven't watched the new ones. I don't want to go there. This is something God gave me at that time. And I would never want to repeat it again. But all of Friday the 13th, all of Halloween series, up to that point, probably um, when I was probably around 30 or 31, and I began to 
counts. My question was, what else are you getting? And, uh, and I was able to share that. I don't know if it ever amounted to anything with the kids that I was talking to, but we take in so much more when we dabble in things we shouldn't be messing with. And so God had driven out great and strong nations. He caused Israel to stand against these nations. No one was able to stand against them. And in the future, he, he said, one man will chase a thousand. And in fact, Leviticus 26, 5, 5, 26, 8, five of you shall chase a hundred. A hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemy shall fall by the sword before you. But that is if they only would take heed to continue to love Yahweh, their God. Again, Mark 12, 30 and 31, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it. That is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Last time I read it from Matthew's gospel, this time from Mark's gospel. But it was obedience to Yahweh that brought victory in Joshua's life and in Israel's generation at that time, but only if they remained faithful to keep and do all that was written in the book of the law, that they would not turn aside to the right or to the left. It takes courage to follow Christ in our world today. We live in an age where um, it's not popular I mentioned doing the shows on Freemasonry. And um, I've done seven of them now, videos uh, through different radio ministries, three different radio ministries. And I don't, I keep saying, I don't think these are going any further. We did create, though, a special web page on our web page, a link on our web page, cclv.org. And uh, we created a special thing under media where you can get all these. Uh, they're right there for you if you want to watch or listen to them. But um, so I'm rehearsing like before the last shows. I'm just, you know, cruising through some of the social media pages. And I see this headline that this person mysteriously died with a necktie Masonic hanging. It's like, what? Necktie Masonic hanging, what's that all about? So apparently, um, they committed suicide hanging themselves on a doorknob, but it probably wasn't suicide um, with someone's necktie. And then just last week, there was some 33-degree Mason in another country that they are looking at some mysterious death that they believe that this man is part of. I mean, these are people that are in powerful, powerful positions. So sometimes it can be, it can take courage to speak out. But we're called to obedience. And in obedience, we will find courage. In Joshua's day, the other nations recognized their gods. They served them with names like Baal or Ashtoreth or Milcom. Israel was not to make mention of these names. Today, we have many different gods that people are bowing down to. They may go by different names, but we need to make sure that we're holding fast, knowing that as believers, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who are, love God, who are called according to his purpose. Because there's going to be in Joshua 23, 12 and 13, there's going to be snares, there's going to be traps, there's going to be scourges, there's going to be thorns. Or else, if indeed you go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you, make marriage with them, marriages with them, go into them and they to you. Know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you. They shall become snares and traps to you, scourges on your side, thorns in your eyes. I don't know what's worse. And these are all bad. 
I don't want to be tripped up, trapped. I don't want somebody scourging my side or running through the woods and getting thorns in my eyes. Until you perish from this good land. He warns them not to go backwards by clinging to the remnant of these nations through marriage or other relationships. Ultimately, they would become snares, traps, scourges, and thorns to them. And God said, I will dispossess you from the land of promise. This reminded me of 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What part does a believer have with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As the Lord said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oftentimes we take those verses and we use it for marriage. You know, don't marry an unbeliever. Yet this stands for multiple situations like dating, like marriage, like business, like clubs or fraternities. Don't be unequally yoked. Being yoked with the nations that Israel was dispossessing would cause God, his judgment to fall upon Israel. And ultimately they would be dispossessed out of their land. But Joshua reminds them, verses 14 through 16, we close out this teaching in this chapter. Behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts that in your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one word of them has failed. Therefore, it shall come to pass that as all the good things have come upon you to which the Lord your God promised you, so the Lord will bring upon you all harmful things until he has destroyed you from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. When you have transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and have gone and served other gods, bowed down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land which he has given you. Joshua had faithfully run his race, and we'll see that in chapter 24 next week. And he reminded this generation that not one word had failed, not one good thing that God has spoken concerning Israel has failed. They had been given a good land. Now it was time for this next generation to take up their banner, to walk in obedience and in love of God. Doing so, they could run their race with confidence. But if they failed to do so, Joshua warned them, God will bring judgment upon you and ultimately drive you out of the land. This would take place. It would take hundreds of years. But the uh, northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, 10 northern tribes would be dispossessed by the Assyrians in 622 B.C., And the southern kingdom, Judah, Benjamin, uh, possibly Simeon in there as well, but Judah and Benjamin, mainly when we talk about the southern kingdoms, they would be dispossessed from the land by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. It took a while for God to take them out, but we must consider, 2 Peter 3.15, consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. God is gracious. We can get off track. He is long-suffering. And when he's long-suffering, his desire is for us to get back on track with him. May it be so that we would walk in the ways of the Lord in such a way 1 Corinthians 16, 13, that we would watch, that we would stand fast in the faith, that we would be brave, be strong, and let all that we do be done with love. Father, we thank you for your word and those things which you have taught us here tonight. And thank you, Lord, for the courage of Joshua and having recorded this for us, 
for our generation to remind us of some very important truths in this generation. Help us be a generation, Lord, who are willing to stand strong and to do so not only for our own selves, but for our children and our children's children. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.